we're trying to solve your individual pain first, right? Um, so that is the focus of our message and that's the intent of the, the product is to make sure that you, when you sign up and you begin using it within the first experience, you get the value of it. Welcome to Uptech Report. I'm excited to continue our conversation now in our Founders Journey series, Leaders Insights, um, to hear how Darren Brown, the CEO and co-founder of Docket, um, has got his company to where he is today. And, and there's always tons of insight from before you start the, whatever venture you're working on right now. And a quick recap of, of Docket, it is a meeting focused platform perfect for making the most out of every meeting. That is their marketing slogan from their websites, <laughs> great there. And if you wanna learn more about it, check out our first uh, part one of our, our interview. But Darren, I'd like to dig a little bit deeper now to hear your story, truly. How did you get to where you are today? Uh, you mean like, you know, I'm- Go back, yeah. <laughs> Let's go back. This makes, how much time do you have? This may take a while. <laughs> so, you know, I, um, I started uh, in software development right at really the right time. I and mean, it was the, the mid nineties, uh, you know, develop, software development was really starting to become a career. I'm based, based in Indianapolis. Um, and there was a lot of really cool startup activity even back in that day. So I joined a startup as a junior developer and um, had a great ride. That, that startup was called Double Take Software. I was there for 11 years. We IPO'd um, and it was just fantastic. You know, I moved through the ranks to mid kind of management and built lots of product and lots of teams and had a fantastic time. And I thought that was great. Let me try that again. And I jumped to another startup um, that I won't name, but it did not go so well. <laughs> <laughs> and I call I, I, you know, I saw the flip side of the startup world, but um, you know, I've just, I've had a great ride. I have been able to stay in prod and tech in Indianapolis my entire career. I spent a few years at a company called exact target that was on just a rocket ship and got acquired by Salesforce. Um, and I moved over from there into a CTO role at Angie's list. Angie's list is based in Indianapolis and we had a, a, a really good time. I'm building a completely brand new tech stack and moving 3 million members over in uh, just a couple of months. So it was, it's been an awesome ride. Um, and that really, as I, you know, talking about what Docket did, um, part of my attraction to this problem was all the different companies I've been in and the different cultures and the different levels I've been in. One thing that was consistent was the unproductive meetings that I had to attend. <laughs> so it seems like a real problem that's worth solving. Now, this is your first venture that you've co-founded. Yes. Okay, yep. so exciting, lots of lessons learning happening right here. Uh, but you've already been in multiple startups who have seen it happening, yes. but yeah. now you're at the helm having to, to lead it. Yep. So I'm intrigued, first off, as far as um, funding wise, have you bootstrapped or is this uh, VC funded or? This is VC funded, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, High Alpha um, Venture Capital Venture Studio is essentially the co-founder um, and the main VC backer. Yep. What would you say is the, the biggest mistake one could make when seeking funding? Um, that's a good question. It's really not understanding the mechanics of the VC world and how funding works and how dilution works and, and those types of conversations. You really, there's a lot of good information out there. The VCs, you know, if you look at their, their um, sites there, it's a lot that they provide. You really need to educate yourself. There's a lot of pros to it, right? The, the ability to get that backing and and really get started and grow very quickly if you're successful. Um, but you you know you just have to be aware of what the trade offs are and how to approach those. Um, from the pitching side, <laughs> uh, yeah. how did you prepare and and what you think is one of the most important lessons you learned from pitching and sharing the, the story and concept to get the funding? Uh, so I had, you know, prod tech role, not really um, sales background at all in pitching and selling, right? So it is, you have to be on all the time. You have to be excited. You have to be energized. Um, you have to tell that story a thousand times, but be excited every time you tell it, right? And it is a story. You have to have a, you know, the, the narrative um, has to be crisp. It has to be understandable. And it has to, you know, mean a lot as you're, as you're talking about it. So I would spend a fair amount of time on the deck itself and look, there's lots of good examples out there. You want to keep it short. You want to tell a good story. Um, you want it visually impactful, which is a lot of thing or a lot of times people don't really think about. Um, but that visual, those visuals tell a good story as well. And you, you really need to put all of that together in order to, to have that strong conversation. 
as you then go ahead and get the funding, you start to build the product. How long did you spend in development? <laughs> well, we spent a couple of months in development before we put it in Prince and Family's hands. Right. So that was step one was, again, this is a uh, doc. It is a uh, solution to a problem that almost everybody has. So it's not hard finding potential customers. Right. Um, so it really was, Hey, people I know in the industry, friends, family, try this out. Let me know what you think. Um, and we had uh, probably three or four months then on that as we iterated through their feedback before we were ready to call something an MVP and put up a website and, you know, have an open beta and just start to drive people to it. And so overall between like start to website available to anybody and product available to anybody is about six months. Okay. Five how months. did you, <laughs> five, five months. <laughs> how did you go about assessing the uh, initial price uh, and uh, kind of determining that? Yeah, it, no, that's an excellent question. So um, what I did was really just look at the competitive set, look at like products, look at products that um, have a very rich feature set and offer maybe a, um, um, conceptually a lot more value versus um, those that are just maybe note-taking apps and where they're at and try to just compare and contrast what value I thought we were bringing to the, to the individual and the, the organization and where we should fall on that spectrum. I will say pricing is one of those as a startup, you should not be afraid to test at all. Mm. Um, most, most startups are undervalue what uh, their offering is. Um, and that is one of the easiest ways to increase your overall ARR is to increase that price by a dollar or two a month. Um, users, if they find value in the product, they, they will not bat an eye to do that, but it's meaningful to your company. Speaking of customers, that's kind of important to get those. Uh, what have you seen as far as uh, common mistakes uh, you, one could make, you've seen you can make or you have made uh, that you would advise against when it comes to marketing in today's world? Uh, so Docket is taking a product-led growth go-to-market strategy, meaning it's freemium. So the bulk of our users come in on the free product, right? And so whatever we're doing has to be cost-effective in, in that manner. Um, we... Our, our long-term strategy is SEO. We want to have that organic search and have people find us that way. The other um, leg to that stool is the product referral. So Docket is a product where I use it in the meetings. The other participants in the meetings see it. They log in, start using it for their own meetings, and it just kind of spreads virally, both internally within the company and in between companies. So that is awesome. Um, but in order to kind of prime that pump and test out the messaging, um, don't neglect the, the paid aspect of things, right? So there, you know, between LinkedIn and Google ads and Facebook, there's lots of opportunity to really test the messaging there and find what works um, and make sure when you're testing that you treat it as a test, you turn it off and when it's not performing and you, you know, you over index when it is performing. Um, as far as uh, this world that we're in where intention, it's, it's it's really difficult to grab someone's attention because there, there's so much overloaded of, of what's happening and the distractions. Any tactics that you found have worked well to grab attention and, and keep it? Yeah, with, um, you know, I've said this a couple of times and uh, I'll say, say it again, with the product-led growth aspect of it, we're trying to solve your individual pain first, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that is the focus of our message. And that's the intent of the, the product is to make sure that you, when you sign up and you begin using it within the first experience, you get the value of it. It's not something where there's a big implementation for it and it's three or four months before it really starts to, to, to be beneficial to the organization. It's really day one. And so our messaging is really around more um, the concepts of, you know, how it affects you per and the emotions that it brings to you, the, that you feel better about your day and you feel better about your meetings, the, the, um, the amount of uh, uh, visibility that your peers have with the product, right? And how it, you are perceived to have run a better meeting and a more organized meeting, right? That's impactful to you from a career standpoint. Those are the, try to, the things that we try to, to, to do. And it's really, a, you know, to your point about grabbing their attention, it's mm -hmm. that emotion, that you, you want to latch on to, right? I want to feel better about my day, um, especially, um, you know, with COVID going on, It's we're in a unique spot in that our product um, is ready-made to make your workday more efficient as you spend hour after hour in Zoom calls. Um, and so it is that emotional kind of, you're frazzled, you just want to be... <laughs> 
you you, yeah you want to be released from that uh emotion that you have you make an interesting point right there if you truly want to grab um attention in today's distractional very distracted world tying it to an emotion is 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 key yeah that they immediately say oh wow that's uh, i feel that emotion i don't want it or that's an emotion i do want to feel yes and then most likely to to get better traction. Love it. Love it. Now to accomplish your vision, you need a good team as well. Um, Building a team, um, any uh, mistakes uh, or, or bad things that one could make in hiring that you would advise against uh, to people avoid? I would say, um, so I was guilty pre COVID of the mindset that I really wanted to build local, Um, you know, especially a startup world, um, building that culture, is critical to the early success of the company. And my view was, you know, if I'm hiring local, I have much better foundation which to build the company. And then as we expand the company, as we're successful, maybe we'll go um, and look at remote employees. Um, all bets are off now, right? So I, I, I mean, my, my blinders are off. Uh, and so even as we conquer COVID and we go back to a more uh, mixed mode, uh, the fact that we can hire anybody from anywhere um, is something that I think we should have done in the beginning and really focused on. You're, the talent pool is so large when you do that. Um, it really opens it up and you shouldn't be afraid of, even in an early stage company, of doing that. Um, you can manage cultural aspects of the company um, effectively as long as you're paying attention to it, no matter if they're local or remote. That's a powerful, powerful insight right there. Uh, how, how big is the team today? Uh, Tim, counting me. And as obviously you grow, the culture itself will change and, and develop. Um, how, how have you found in previous companies now to, into where you are now, you kind of know, I imagine, the steps and, and what to expect and feel. Um, any insight there of, of what you need to pay attention to to make sure you're, you're not losing something? Yeah, I, I mean, it really comes down to your actions as a, lead, as a leader and the actions of the leadership team. It doesn't matter what you say, what, what culture you write down on your mission statement or your, your employee handbook or, you know, the, what, what you say during the all hands meetings or anything like that. It's how you carry yourself day to day, your interactions with the employees and the teams. That's what's going to carry through. And that's why I, I, you know, looking back on it, you have those interactions regardless of the person sitting next to you or they're sitting a thousand miles away. Right. So that really is what drives culture. It's more your actions. People pay attention to what you do much more than what you say. Um, and as long as you're cognizant of that and honest to yourself and where you want to go, um, you'll be okay. Any thoughts that pop in your head from the previous companies that you've worked at where you're like, wow, you should have done that differently or, and you weren't managing it at the time, but you experienced it that you would advise <laughs> around it. Um, yeah. Uh, so there were the, the, the unnamed startup, mm-hmm. uh, they wanted to build this. This was, mid 2000s and they wanted to build this um, what they viewed as Silicon Valley kind of culture where people are working all hours of the night and day. So, you know, they essentially mandated the Friday um, afternoon beer, right? So uh, <laughs> at the end of the day, you were highly encouraged to meet as a group and socialize versus letting people do that organically. Um, you know, and like the, the manager meetings were held at Sunday night at nine o'clock and went till midnight, right? And it was this kind of forced, um, you know, let's build this high energy company when you really have to do that organically. That's not something mm-hmm. that you mandate. Mandating uh, <laughs> a culture like that, I can see that may not yeah. build that well. Uh, then go, looking forward from here, going to next year, what kind of uh, challenges do you see you're gonna need to overcome uh, in order to continue growing? Uh, it really is. Um, so we've we've taken the the playbook of do things that don't scale to heart, right? So we're a small team and we're trying just trying to get started. And if you let the idea that you have to build everything that that will scale, um, you know, before you can you can do anything, you'll never get you'll never get anything completed, right? So we're doing a lot of things that are unnatural if we really scale. And so that's the big challenge is how to move those things from kind of more the manual and the, the just brute force method to, um, you know, automating that to making sure it just happens uh, as we grow. Um, because we still have to, we have to do all of that. Plus we have to move forward and do all these new things as well. Right. It is, it's that rocket ship, right. That you hope you're on. It's, it's a lot of pressure. It's, um, but it's 
pressure in a good way, right? It is fun um, when you're successful. As far as knowing, having the right knowledge to keep growing, are there any uh, books, audiobooks, podcasts that you are currently reading, listening to right now, or would recommend previously that you have read? Uh, well, I will give a plug to a, a, a podcast called Read to Lead. Um, I do listen to it often. Um, it, it comes out weekly, and there, I'll be transparent. It's my brother's podcast. He's been doing it for several years. Um, go check it out. But he interviews uh, a lot of uh, top name authors uh, on leadership books and kind of pro- productivity books and those types of things. Um, and just listening to that, I know immediately whether I want to go buy that book. It saves me a lot of time. You get a lot of insights just listening to it. So I do listen to that quite a bit. And I have a long stack of books sitting on my nightstand that I need to work through. Last question for you, Dan. What kind of technology innovations do you predict we'll see in the short term next year or so and long term next five, 10 years? Well, I think, um, again, the, the, you know, COVID has changed or I was, COVID has um, sped up a lot of activity in, in technology, right? And so I think the concepts of AR and VR um, and how they you know, occur in the workplace is really going to come to the forefront. Um, if you think about like, um, I'll bring this back to meetings, right? One of the challenges that, me- that people still have with meetings is the whiteboarding session. And we, you know, the docket team, you know, we're all remote right now. We do have an office and the only time we go into the office is if we need one of those whiteboarding sessions, right? There are a lot of technologies that exist today and a lot of products that attempt to solve that digitally, right? But it's really missing the point. It's not the interaction of drawing on a screen or drawing on a whiteboard and being able to see that in real time, that's the challenge. It's the human interaction of seeing, reading the body language and seeing that sideways glance and the, you know, those kind of little, um, little items that you're gonna miss small because cues. you're focused on the screen. Yes, the small cues. And so I think if you, you start to think about it and start to enable or layer on some VR or AR into that, where it is, is you're, you're seeing individuals and you're seeing the medium at the same time in a much more realistic way than what we can do now. That's really when it gets really exciting to me. I am excited about that potential. We've actually interviewed a few v- different VR companies and it's that uh, ne- whole next step, which hardware and other things have to catch up, but we're, yeah. we are getting closer. Thank you so much, Dan, for sharing your insight, the the lessons that you've learned over these years. And now there's there's more to learn. So we'll have to check <laughs> back in, 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 a few, in another year or two Absolutely. and see what else we have to share. Yeah, thank you for having me on. And thank you, uh, everyone else, for joining us on this Founders Journey, uh, uh, part of our uh, UpTech Report series. Our sponsor, again, for today's episode is TerraLeap. If your company wants to learn how to better leverage the power of video to increase sales and marketing results, head over to TerraLeap.io. We'll see you guys next time. Have you seen a company using AI, machine learning, or other technology to transform the way we live, work, and do business? Go to UpTechReport.com and let us know.